Hello, my name is Jeremy Chamberlain with Nippon Pulse America, product manager for the linear shaft motor systems today. We're going to talk a little bit about them, how they work, how they're used and designed for ultra high precision motion systems. The basic design concept behind the linear shaft motor was to be a simple product consisting of just the forcer which has the coils and the shaft which has the magnets. On top of that, it's a completely non-contact device with aerial air gaps from 0.5 to 5 millimeter nominal air gap, 1 to 10 millimeter bore difference. And also, it's completely non-critical, no variation of the force over the entire stroke of the device, no matter how the air gap varies, as you can see up there. Also, it is designed to be an ultra-high precision device. It is the only linear motor designed exclusively for the ultra-high precision market. We'll talk a little bit how that works. In the ultra-high precision market, usually below one micron down into 10 to um, nanometer precision, the mechanism is critical in the design of the system. And the motor and the servo loop, all comprise of a triangle of components. While mechanical stiffness is extremely component, motor design has got to the point that most people consider it just to be the motor's the motor, in which case is Many servo loops have become very advanced in order to compensate for many of the faults in the motor. So some of the issues that people deal with with motors and ultra high precision devices have to do with the forces that are generated both internally and externally on the motor, the stiffness of the motor itself, and also the heat that the motor generates as far as linear motion systems go. If we look at the typical linear motors used in these type of systems, such as the flat iron core linear motors, uh, whether it be the cylindrical type or the flat linear type, you get forces such as eddy currents that are designed and generated internally into the device. These eddy currents cause a nonlinear force to current ratio, which makes the servo loop not function properly and it fights against the servo loop system. To kind of illustrate how strong these eddy currents can be, if you've ever seen these roller coasters that go off and they have the zero to 60 in half a second and really take off, the way they stop those roller coasters is through eddy currents, through a magnetic and iron-based system plates that they run on the bottom of the roller coaster. So those eddy currents can be quite um, counteractive to your linear forces you're generating. In addition to that, iron core linear motors have cogging as well as absorption forces and centering forces on the magnetic track. So all these are acting counteractive to the actual linear force and precision that you're trying to generate at that time. On the other side, the linear shaft motor has no heat sinks, no iron in the forcer or the shaft, thus you have no cogging and no eddy currents that are being generated to counteract what you're doing. The other type of linear motor that was generated to kind of interact some of these issues with the eddy currents and the cogging and the attractive forces was the U-shaped ironless core or coreless motor. The issues that counteract with this have to do mainly with heat. Um, the heat, because the coils are sandwiched between the magnets, there's no way to go, so the heat has to be directed back to your work point in your system. Heat is a drastic problem when we talk with ultra high precision devices. Um, the other problem is the epoxy core contributes, does not contribute to the stiffness of your system. Um, it can become a weak point in the system. Whereas an iron core motor has a Young's module of around 210 mega pi, a U-shaped motor will have a Young's module about 1.9. Um, so I usually try to illustrate that, that if you take a piece of uh, a, a small, just a platform, a piece of paper with a cardboard backing, and you try to push a heavy object, let's say a bottle of water, it won't bend or flex, and that's your, use, your iron core motor. You take a couple pieces of paper and you try to push it, and your piece of paper will bend and flex as you're trying to push a heavy object. The same way with iron core, a U-shaped motor. Once you get below one micron of precision, your motor and your coil starts to flex and bend. Um, in which case, then the servo loop has to compensate for that bending and flexing that's happening at that lower phase. To counteract this, we took that same concept and just turned the coils into a cylinder. That cylinder increases the stiffness of the motor by a factor of 100. So the Young's module of the linear shaft motor is about 190. Not quite as stiff as an iron core motor, but we don't have any of the issues with the cogging, the eddy currents that are normally attributed to that type of linear motion. Also, because the coils are located on the outside of the magnet, we get maximum heat dissipation throughout the coil, and the heat's not trapped internal to the magnets like we see with the U-shaped linear motor. Every linear motor that's on the market, no matter what type you have, is currently aggressively rated. They have the ratings based on heat sinks that are on the system, whether that be the orientation of the motor, 
So you see with this manufacturer, if you, the motor stands still, then you have to reduce your coil by 90%. If the mo coil is mounted sideways, you only get, you have to take another 20% off of the linear motor and its ratings. Um, whether it be a large heat sink, almost every linear motor that's out there has to have a heat sink, and they usually specify that either on the data sheet, back in some tech manual, or some guy just knows that you have to ask, he'll actually tell you what that heat sink is supposed to be. Airflow around the system itself, whether it be continuous air or some type of air cooling on the motor, and also water, water cooling, in this case it is 5 degrees C temperature, the 2 gallons a minute is what this linear motor is rated, or heat exchangers on the motor. On the other, they're all these linear motors are designed to direct their heat to the point that's being worked on, which again, heat is a huge factor when we talk about ultra high precision devices. The linear shaft motor, on the other hand, does not direct any heat to the work point. It's not designed that way. Its ratings that are published in the catalog are based on no external heat sinking whatsoever. So if you take the motor and you set it on the table, it will give you the force ratings at the temperature ratings that it specifies in the catalog. So this kind of clarify what we talked about a little more. The cylindrical design greatly increases the stiffness of the linear shaft motor, um, the heat dissipation because the coil allows for maximum airflow around the coils to get out and to cool itself, and also it has a completely linear force to current ratio due to the fact that it has no eddy currents and the, no heat output into the motor itself. But the basic efficiency of the linear shaft motor has to come from Lorette's formula. What we do is we have to be able to get the maximum amount of force out of the motor with the least amount of efficiency or heat put out of the motor. So how do we do this? Well, to increase, decrease the current going through the winding, which will increase our current, we have to increase our crossing vector, increase the length of our copper, and increase our magnetic field strength in the motor. And that's the basic law behind Lorette's formula. How do we do that? Well, as far as the crossing vector goes, with the cylindrical design of the motor, 100% of the magnetic flux that's coming from our shaft actually gets uh, crosses at a 90 degree angle from the copper. So that gives us our maximum efficiency as far as crossing. This also gives us a completely non-critical air gap. So no matter where the shaft may go within that um, bore inside the forcer, the force is always continuously linear on our output that we go. The next thing we have to look at is the length of our copper and the length of the wire. The longer it is, the more force we can get out for the less current. But on the other hand, we have to balance that with our IR losses as far as heat generated due to resistance. So we found that critical point on each different diameter. So our magnetic pitches vary anywhere from 18 to 240 millimeters in length, or our coils anywhere from 340 millimeters wide. Thus, we can get the maximum amount of length of copper before we get too much for IR losses, which heat generated from that point. The last point that we do is actually the patent design we have, which is actually putting the north to north and south to south right together and pushing together. That basically kinks and redirects this magnetic field to the point that we actually get a much stronger magnetic field that crosses our copper, um, or usually to the order of um, two to three times stronger than what you'll see than most linear motors that are out there. Um, this contributes to the efficiency of the motor itself. An independent study done by the University of Virginia showed that compared to a comparable U-shaped motor, the linear shaft motor with the same rated force output, the same rated resistance, and the same rated current for continuous power actually consumed one half of the energy to create the same amount of work output on the device. If you have a chance to stop by our booth, we actually have these two motors running. And you can actually see where they're actually pushing against each other, doing the same work, but yet the heat actually dissipated to the work point is a lot lower on the device. So this actually helps with ultra high precision. But no matter how efficient the linear motor is, or any motor, it will direct heat and generate heat. Well, most devices try to do through heat sinking or redirecting a heat or heat isolation from the work point for ultra high machining applications. But on a linear shaft motor, we can actually move the motor away from the center point. And we do this by doing what we call a parallel drive. We take the, the two motor that would normally be positioned in the center of your device and move them out to the edges of the force. By doing that, and doing half the size of the motor, you end up with the same amount of work, the net effect being in the very center point, or in the center of the gravity of the linear shaft motor. So we end up with basically a system where we have a motor on each side, a linear encoder in the center of your work point, which gives us the best feedback for the point one, and we can operate that off of a single servo loop. 
Um, and this is unique in the linear shaft motor. Part of the capability that allows us to do this is the fact that our um, magnetic pitches are so long that we can actually reduce the sign error that happens along with the mechanical um, stiffness of the system that we go here. So to kind of demonstrate this, this is a company called Yasna, the ultra high, one of the premier ultra high precision machine tool manufacturers in the world. They built the system with the linear shaft motor. Here we have four linear shaft motors for each act, X and Y, and Y here. And they took a thermal imaging camera and took a picture. Now this was to test out the water cooling option that we offered for them. But what the images we're going to see here are the before images, where they operate the machine without any water cooling at all to show you the heat efficiency of the linear shaft motor. So at, when they started, basically the temperature of the whole system was less than 20 degrees C. And as we continue to go, one hour, two hours, four hours, five hours, six hours of operation, even after six hours of operation, we still had less than 20 degrees C temperature rise, or absolute temperature, right in the very center of that stage. So the heat was not being penetrated out of the motors, so thus it didn't have to penetrate as much into the system itself that's being operated. But the interesting part about this is not only is it good for ultra-high precision machines, it can also be brought into general automation. So when you're doing gantry systems, the fact that you can have one, two linear motors on each side operating with one encoder and one servo loop can be a great cost savings in overall system design and how it's put together. You can still have very high acceleration rates and very good accuracy. In this case, we've got four Gs of acceleration with five micron accuracy right here in this XY with a dual arch on the system. A good illustration of this and how it compares to other motion systems is a system that was put together for um, Robostar in Korea. This is a 300 kilogram arch over a three meter span. They went and they tested four different linear motor manufacturers. Technotion, Parker with the Trilogy motors, Iskawa, and our linear shaft motor. Um, all were required to meet certain velocity standards, 1.6 meters per second at half a G. They were looking for velocity stability at 100 millimeters per second and also settling time, 400 millimeters a second at 1.15 G within plus minus five micron. Because the linear shaft motor was operated with one servo drive and one encoder, whereas all the other three were operated with two encoders and two servo drives, they also tested on the linear shaft motor what our jitter at stop was for 20 seconds and also our position difference as we actually moved that 300 kilogram arch over the three span, how far were the two axes apart from each other with only one encoder feedback being given. So what we got here is the results from the Yaskawa. As we can see, the Yaskawa is an iron cord linear motor, so we actually see the cogging as it went along. It was able to meet the velocity and maximum acceleration as all four motors were able to do. Velocity stability of 0.21%, point to point move, which is 400 milliseconds to actually move and settle. The next motor, which was the Trilogy, also met the velocity and maximum acceleration at a velocity stability of 0.08% and a point-to-point -point move settle of 320 milliseconds for this application. Technotion, on the other hand, was able to meet the velocity and maximum acceleration. Velocity stability similar to the Trilogy, 0.09%, but point-to-point -point move exactly the same at 320 milliseconds. The linear shaft motor here on this hand was able to meet the velocity and the maximum acceleration. Velocity stability 0.06, so it was able to be the most stable as far as the velocity goes, and also able to move and settle within 280 milliseconds. This was primarily due to the fact that we only had one servo loop based on the three servo loops required for the two servo drives together, one for each of the drives and then the loop that actually connects the two together as far as positioning. As far as position difference, as we expect, with only one, one servo drive, one axis took off just a little before the other, this was a difference of 1.66 micrometers over a three meter span. So as we see here, one axis took off just a little bit before the other, and the axis stopped a little bit after the other. The jitter stopped for 20 seconds was less than one half of a count, 52.3 um, nanometers of jitter between the two axes over its motion. So the basic points of the linear shaft motor have to do with the core, it's a coreless linear motor, it's a simple design, so it has a simple drive principle as far as its operation. It's very responsible. It will actually respond exactly to what the servo drive gives it and tells it to do. It's one of the only linear motors that behaves in a servo loop 
as good as you know, it's supposed to. And it's increased high, very high accuracy. It can give you very low ripple at low speed or very high acceleration and deceleration for high accuracy applications and high speed applications. Its cost of performance is very easy to integrate for mass production. It's actually simpler to put in than a ball screw. Um, and it's a lot, the machining costs are about the same as a ball screw in, um, in a machine. So the cost is lower for machining. It's also easy to handle. There's no concerns about unevenness of force over the variation, no matter how the gap is. And there's no concern about the motor wearing out or maintenance that has to be done on the motor itself over the life of your machine. So just to cover the highlight points, the coil is around the magnetic field 360 degrees. This allows for the maximum efficiency of the linear shaft motor. It operates on basic Fleming's law, which is the same for all motors, whether it be rotary or linear that's out there. Our patented magnetic design, along with the other considerations in the design of the motor, make it the most efficient linear motor that's currently on the market. And the linear shaft motor is able to achieve high accuracy and high efficiency with a very simple design. I guess at this point, we're open to any questions that might be had on the linear shaft motor at this point. Okay, that was basically the presentation we have, and thank you for coming, and I'll see you later. If you want to see the motor in operation, we actually have 1724. We have quite a number of them operating in stages, underwater, in harsh environments, and in, um, also in compared to the U-shaped linear motors, hard to speed out there. Thank <laughs> you.